No, this is this is inhabited. this reminds me of Silo from the book Rule. I haven't seen that. Oh, but I have read the first book. Uh, not this is what it reminds me of. Oh, yeah. right, we are now being right. kicked up everywhere. Very okay, good. fine. So I will just do my recording, which I will re-record later. Sure, no problem. Okay, so hello and welcome to the Culture Bar, an arts and culture podcast series brought to you by Harrison Parrot. In our Speed Podcast mini-series of quick insights into music and culture from around the world, we talk to music industry professionals about the music of their homeland to give us a view into different music, composers, sounds and instruments which make music both unique and universal. Today we will be talking to a Harrison Parrott Artist Coordinator, Teo. Teo, please tell us a bit more about yourself. Hi, my name is Teo, or Theodor Kung in full. Uh, I'm from Sasserg, a small village in the Jura Mountains overlooking Lake Geneva. I've been an artistic coordinator with Harrison Parrott for about five months, and uh, previous to that I worked as a concert violinist with orchestras in the UK and across Europe. Fantastic. So you are very well placed to talk to us about music and everything Swiss. So um, it would be great if we could just dive in, seeing as this is a speed pod. Sure. Um, so in your opinion, what has influenced Swiss music? Is it the landscape, language, location? chocolate <laughs> <laughs> well it's a mix of all i mean swiss music and swiss art in general doesn't get as much attention as it as it might and maybe as it should probably because um, it's a rather small country whose five neighbors include france germany austria and italy all nations who have made tremendous contributions to what is widely considered to be the canon of western music not to mention painting architecture sculpture and all the rest of it so this means that um, here in the UK, for instance, even if people know about British creative types who have been inspired by Switzerland, like Mary Shelley or J.M. Turner or Freddie Mercury, mm -hmm. uh, they are unlikely to have heard of, say, the Swiss painter Caspar Wolf, uh, who's, who's a wonderful 19th century painter, or they might not even know that composers such as Franck Martin and Ernest Bloch are originally Swiss. So when talking about what influences Swiss music, um, obviously the surrounding countries have exerted an immense cultural pull from the outside. Um, more fundamentally, though, I think that Swiss art and Swiss society, in general, has historically speaking, been defined by the topography of the country mm. itself. The reason why Swiss identity uh, is so strong and so unified, despite a divided history, I think, uh, as well as different languages and a fragmented geography, is that the lives of the people who live there are punctuated by the same seasonal rhythms. Whether you uh, live in um, uh, Zurich or Vive or Bellinzona, uh, anywhere you are across the country, the cut. Yes. Wherever you live across the country, your lifestyle traditionally is defined by the area's dominating feature, which is mountains. Uh, your life in the passage of time would have been marked by the same events snow in winter, melting and floods in the spring haymaking and the pasturing of cattle in the autumn, <laughs> uh, and then snow again. So it's a unifying factor. And so inevitably, traditional depictions of Swiss life in music and art tend towards the pastoral, the rural, the idealized country life. Right up until the 1920s, when people like Arthur Honegger started doing all sorts of weird experimentations <laughs> with sound and so on. Oh, that's, that's fascinating. I feel like I've had an entire history of, uh, of Switzerland in, in one go. So no, thank you very much. That was very, very descriptive. And I have a, a really beautiful view of uh, Switzerland, actually, in my mind from a cultural perspective, which you don't always get. You know, like you said, you, when I think of Switzerland, I always think of mountains. Yeah, well, exactly. Yes. And um, lakes. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, I mean, that, I think 90, for, 90 to 95 percent of the country is technically uninhabitable because oh it's goodness. either mountains, lakes or forest. Oh, wow. OK. <laughs> which leaves precious little to, to do your sculpting and your, your music writing. Yeah. Absolutely. And I suppose that makes it all the more important, actually, doesn't it, to well, utilise it? So, yeah. But we're, we're lucky in the sense that our national character has a very strong image in the public mind. Yeah, absolutely. And um, moving from that, so are there any sounds that define Swiss music? Oh, yeah. Well, within this pastoral idea, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is probably what we call Ländlermusik, which is um, country music or folk music with the usual bells, alphorns, accordions and ubiquitous yodeling everywhere, of course, that sort of thing. Um, but actually, there's a, a rich tradition of music that's much more textured and interesting uh, than the uh, commercial stuff that was formalized in the 19th, early 20th century. Uh, in the West, for instance, there's a strong choral tradition, which is epitomized by the work of the abbot Joseph Bove, who lived in Fribourg. While in the East, you get zithers and violin duets, which sound actually much more Austro-Hungarian mm. than you might expect. 
Um, incidentally, a huge collection of songs was transcribed in the early part of the 20th century by a woman called Hani Christen. And some of the earlier traditional songs have some very dark and melancholy um, undertones, which, well, as a violinist, I've always loved traditional Irish and Scottish fiddle music. Um, and there's a song with uh, t a song set to words by Rabbi Burns called John Anderson, My Joe. I don't know if you know it. I do, yeah. And it, uh, I, I, I will in briefly inflict my voice on your listeners. So it goes, John Anderson, me Joe, John, when we were first acquainted, your locks were like the raven and bonny brew was spent, something like that. And there's a Swiss song uh, called the Gukesberg Lied, which goes back at least to the uh, 17th century, possibly earlier, which goes... Which has a very similar character and melancholy and um, and uh, minor key and all that sort of stuff. So it's not all sort of, you know, higgly gaggly joyful sort of stuff. <laughs> and cowbells. Well, exactly. Although there is that too. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yeah, sure. There's a valley in Schwitz, in one of the cantons called Schwitz, where my father's from, called the Muttal, which is stuck at the back of a valley. It's very inaccessible. And it's a place where you still get traditional cow herding, and they make the bells by hand. And you're supposed oh, to be wow. able to tell who made the bell by the sound that the <laughs> bell makes. That's amazing. App apparently. And, and did your father make a cowbell? No. <laughs> so you don't have a, a family cowbell that's uh, your unique sound? No, but we have a goat bell. Oh, wow, which okay. We, which my mother would ring uh, because we lived... Uh, <laughs> this is going to sound a little bit strange, but we lived at the top of a hill at the back of a small village. And we would often be roaming around in the woods, and in order to let us know that it was lunchtime or dinner time, she would just ring the bell very loudly. That's perfect. I love that idea. <laughs> so that's your kind of reference to a, a Swiss sound, your your, your yes, mother's exactly. goat bell. Sort of it, it all started. Oh, quite. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I suppose that segues quite nicely onto: Are there any instruments that you can only find in in, in Switzerland, or is it mostly taken from the other surrounding countries? No, there are. And actually, I, I didn't think I was going to talk about the lunchtime goat bell, but that segues very nicely into what I did want to talk about. Because apart from the Alphorn, which everyone knows, there's something called the Swiss bells, Ooh. or the Alpine bells, which is not one instrument exactly. It's more like a big table with a few dozen small bells laid out chromatically in a scale. And you play them by picking them up and jiggling them individually. It's basically someone looked at a Celeste and thought, you know what would make this even better? Take away all of the helpful mechanics and the keyboard and just multiply the, the effort by like 12. And that would be brilliant. I mean, it's a bit silly, but um, I think usually it's only performed as like a showcase piece. I don't think there are many serious Alpine Bells oh, soloists. You never know. It Maybe could come back. Future. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe we could represent one at Harrison Parrot. Ooh, I wonder how you would... <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Too difficult. <laughs> exactly, yes. Difficult to sell to the big holes. Um, and can you tell us about one or two composers or soloists to exemplify uh, Swiss music? Yeah, well, we've al I've already mentioned Ernest Bloch, mm -hmm. uh, and the music he wrote inspired by his own Jewish heritage is very well known, uh, especially perhaps the, the Baal Shem suite. But there's also some very interesting secular stuff that I would definitely recommend, such as Paysage, or Landscapes, um, and Dans les Montagnes, in the literally in the mountains, which tie into a lot of the themes that we've discussed. Um, and also of interest, uh, I would say, are the symphonies of the not-so-well-known Joachim Raff, who was a 19th century composer, who wrote some really lovely pieces. Um, I would recommend, for instance, his 11th symphony, which sounds surprisingly Russian. I think it has a winter theme, mm -hmm. and... Uh, I think there's a lot of echoes of Tchaikovsky. I, he was clearly a fan of what mm -hmm. was going on in Russia mm -hmm. at the time, and I think you'll hear it. Maybe he was inspired by all the um, mountains and snow. I think so, yes. <laughs> they were going for some... I mean, it's it's all quite accessible. It's not experimental in a chromatic sense, mm -hmm. but it is very evocative, and it's clearly written by someone of great skill and achievement, mm -hmm. who I think should be better known. No, that's lovely, and it's really nice to have a recommendation of a less well-known composer as well so we can we can all dive into that and experience that music for ourselves so um and we're just coming to the end of our um speed pod recording now um and we've asked teo to come up with a book an album and a film um to delve deeper into swiss music and culture so theo if you could give us your book recommendation first right well this is not necessarily a straightforward one to begin with <laughs> Uh, so for anyone who's interested in the fundamental archetypes of story and storytelling, I would recommend Carl Jung's essays, Ooh. particularly a collection called Archetypes and the Collective Unconscious, which were written in the mid-30s. 
Uh, full disclosure, I find them very difficult to read, okay. <laughs> even in English. I mean, let's not even talk about the original German. <laughs> um, but they contain the most amazing insights into why we as humans need stories and how mythology and fairy tales and religious texts from all over the world, no matter what culture you're talking about, those original narratives into which uh, the fundamental lessons about good and evil and understanding and sin and redemption and all that are, are interwoven, how even if they're merely taken at face value, they can teach you, at least partly, what it means to be human and to live well. Ooh. So if you can bear to crack that one open, <laughs> I think it will be a very rewarding read. Absolutely. Um, and your album recommendation. Album, right. Well, we've been talking about winter, and we're heading towards the winter months, and in the UK there's a great choral tradition which really comes into its own around Christmas time. Um, so for a taste of the Swiss equivalent, I would recommend Chanson d'ici, which is recorded by... Uh, La Croche Coeur Vocal Ensemble uh, in Fribourg in 2001 uh, and contains a lot of the music of the uh, Abbot Joseph Bovet who I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. and it's a really lovely collection and represents a nice mix across the country's various histories and language groups including Fribourg's local Patois dialect which has sadly Ooh. disappeared largely and which is m almost entirely preserved in the Psalms of oh, that canton. Interesting, yeah, that's a really lovely way to preserve a language actually. Yeah, How well, interesting. I think music is in some ways vocal music is designed to preserve stories and heritage mm. and it does it very well and things live on there that will will not be seen again in uh, in everyday life. Oh, no, that's really fascinating. That's a really great uh, recommendation. Thank you. And on to your final recommendation, film. Well, I'm going to go right down the middle of the road here uh, and recommend Luigi Comencini's adaptation of Heidi from 1952. Oh, wow. <laughs> which, yes, the book that everyone knows, the one book everyone probably accept, uh, expected me to mention. So the film was made in 1952, um, and it's based on the book by Johannes Spiri, uh, and it's a charming old black and white film. And... While it's not exactly an Oscar winner, shall we say, I mean, it's done with fairly low budget uh, methods and, uh, and in, it's in black and white in the 50s. But it's, um, it's a picture, it's as much a picture of Switzerland in the 50s as it is a depiction of the story, which is set in the late 19th century. And it always reminds me of my father because he was a young boy himself when the film was made and he would have been very familiar with the landscape and the people and that way of life. So it's quite close to our own personal history as well as anything else. Oh, that's lovely. Well, thank you for sharing a, a personal history book um, no with us. And um, thank you very much for telling us all about Swiss music and the culture of Switzerland. My pleasure. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you.